Hey guys, welcome uh, to that Biomass episode. What are we on, Zell? Forty-three. Forty-three. Awesome. So yeah, it's it's going to be a real weird show. It's going to be really short, I think, and we have a total of uh, three people to talk to you tonight. So there's actually like the the whole room echoes. We're we're going to be like editing it out of the podcast, but like we can just like say something, and you could just hear it echoing through the emptiness of this channel. There's 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 nobody here. Pretty much, yeah. And it doesn't help the fact that my internet has been unstable as hell lately, so if the streaming cuts out and I stop talking, you know what happened. But anyways, uh, so yeah, like I said, it's going to be a pretty short show. We'll start off with shout-outs and then probably roll into a CPM update. So, uh, Actually, start- end with shout-outs, you know. Shall yeah. we? Well, have introductions, the thing. You know, we don't have Jason here. Uh, he's predisposed with yeah, uh, I mean, he's got, families, he's, I think. He's got this thing, like, you know, uh, memorized. So he could just kind of spit this out without thinking about it. You're having to try and put all this together on the fly. Well, I'm usually either half asleep or not paying attention at this point. So I, I wake what? up when they say they say okay. pokey, and that's about it. Okay. All right. <laughs> we'll that's we'll start from the top with Janik. Hi, I'm Janik Menaheim. Um, according to Zell, I'm only half a guest. Don't have my better half here, not Jadek Menaheim, but I, I'm a photographer and artist. I make things for Dust and Eve. He's also a prolific uh, Twitter poster, which I should start doing <laughs> because I, I don't Twitter at all. A friend of, a friend of, of our uh, Japanese Dust plant fans. So. Shout outs. You'll have to quote some of the uh, fun Google Translate uh, tweets you had earlier, uh, but so. I'm Sir Izel. I'm a member of CPM1, um, a co-host here on the show, and a soon-to-be first-time-ever FanFest attendee. Oh, very nice. Uh, and I'm Pokey Draven from OSG Planetary Operations and co-host here on Biomast. So when is FanFest? I'm, I'm not going, um, obviously. FanFest is, I think it's I think it's March 19th through the 21st, I want to say. I'm, Jeez. I've got like a 10-day a trip booked, including all the, f- the flights, because i got to fly to New York in, in order to fly to Iceland, because they don't fly out of Chicago. Um, and I packed in a couple extra days to kind of see stuff while I'm there. Um, but it's coming up. It's, it's, it's pretty soon, so... Yeah, it always creeps up on me. I, I for whatever reason, think it's in May. And well, it's, it is. It was in March. It's, that's the thing. They moved it up two months this year. It normally oh, okay. it's in May. Um, well, they moved it. it up to March in part, I think, to coincide with like, a, um, is it an eclipse that's going to be specifically visible, ideally from Iceland at that time, yeah, something like that. that. Yeah, um, I about that. So yeah, they moved it up two months this year. Very nice. And. To clarify, I believe that CCP Frame came out and said that there is no specific Dust keynote at FanFest, but there will be roundtables with Rotati there. Uh, Do you um, know if those are going to be published at all, or are they just going to kind of be behind closed doors? So I know that uh, JC, Rotati, Frame will all be there. Um, And they're supposed to be, uh, you know, they're supposed to be roundtables. Actually, so the the CPM update is actually that we're we're meeting with CCP tonight. kind of to, to discuss, um, you know, FanFest, um, since it's probably the last time we'll, we'll have a meeting prior to. Um, hopefully we'll get a bit of a heads up on, on anything that's going on outside of the dust stuff and, and hopefully some more specifics on the dust stuff, like, you know, which round tables about what, who's there at each one, if, you know, whatever. Um, and, you know, maybe maybe next week I'll be able to tell you that if, if, if they let me. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, there's going to be, you know, I'm sure the Dust players are going to, um, you know, gravitate together and there's going to be, you know, they're going to do like a pub crawl thing um, with the Dust people and, and stuff. And there should be some round tables, um, but there shouldn't be any big Dust to do there um, this year. And with those round tables, I know uh, last year the the intention was to have those round tables to kind of clarify the whole uh, debacle with Legion, we're, we're going to be streamed or at least you know published, and they never were. Do you know if that's yeah. going to happen this year? Um, I don't know. I'm hoping that is something I can find out tonight. Um, at you know, I I know that like so there was the 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 CSM summit um, notes, and one of the things that was noted there was that there was a request that more roundtables be um, streamed or posted online. And CCP stated something like they didn't have the staff to record them all or something. And that anyways, they liked having some things exclusive for attendees or some such. Um, so I don't know if we will get any, you know, how, how many of the coveted, you know, stream streamable slash recordable, whatever events we will be able to do. Um, 
I I do know that whether or not there is, um, either Denny or myself will probably record them and post them online anyways. Um, like if they'll let me, I have so I have a I have a HD camcorder. Um, if they'll let me, I will literally put the tripod tripod in the bag, and I will set up a tripod and film it myself. If that's you know if if that's okay with that, um, and and if not, I think Denny will do like a cell phone recording. So we'll we'll try and get you know it out there. And if there's any, of course, if there's any information that that does manage to get out during FanFest, um, we'll we'll make sure to convey that because there's I think four there's going to be four CPM uh, at FanFest this year. So yeah, I mean that that's good to hear that that at least is an intention because i mean i have an eve account but i don't really play eve i mean i'll log in and, and futz around every once in a while but other than that i really have no reason to pay attention to fan fest this year because of the lack of dust content so if there was some sort of recording or even a streaming of the the round tables that would be huge yeah, for me if something comes up we'll let you know um awesome and uh you know especially if something gets said that's that's worthy of, of folks knowing about um we'll let you know and uh, actually, like, I, I'm on a, I've got a 10 day trip out there, so it, there should be one episode of Biomass that I should be recording from Iceland. Um, oh, cool. I, I haven't figured out the time record, the time, time change on that yet, though, so I'm, I'm not entirely sure how awake I'll be. <laughs> so if we'll you're doing it yourself, if that's why. <laughs> okay, <laughs> good to know. But yeah, that'll actually be kind of cool to have a, an Icelandic uh, Biomass episode. Well, I'm not going to be speaking Icelandic. Well, you you could get lessons from Ratati. You can That's start going to loggies all the time. That's not going to happen either. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, that that's cool though. I'm, it's it's I I do hope that something comes of it. I know that we are, despite much improved communication on Ratati's part, it would be kind of cool to get some some tidbit of information out of FanFest because that is kind of a a big deal for the company. So I think that the Dust players would would really appreciate that. So is is that it for your CPM update? Just that you're going to be discussing yeah, the, yeah. the schedule for? I mean, it's it's been quiet, but hopefully we'll uh, you know we've got that coming up, so that's exciting. And then FanFest. So is the the Chinese New Year actually over now? Like, is is that yeah? They're back, in, done? they're back. They're back in the office. Okay. Um, I mean, but you know, so so you know, usually how this this whole sort of thing you know goes is if you're going to be on a on a decently lengthy break from from work you you try and kind of get everything wrapped up and out the door as much as you can before the before the trip so you know they come back in the office and now they got to get started on you know the next thing and start you know spinning stuff up again it takes a little bit before they have anything really worth saying yeah yeah. no i i I work in an office too i know how that goes so (laughs) it's totally understandable but yeah i think a lot of people are looking forward to to conversing with uh, Rattati and, and whatnot again. I think that's, they need breaks, obviously, but at the same time, the, the silence is especially tough for us when there's not much to talk about for, you know, a couple of weeks there. And with our need to fill like an hour plus of, of time with meaningless banter and flotsam. Where we, we try to waste time by talking about how much we don't have to talk about. But yeah, spoilers. I think, we're doing a, is, I think we're doing a pretty good job on that so far. Yeah, you yeah, are. I, yeah. I, I don't think we're going to get a full hour out of this one, though, unless breaking news happens in the middle well, of the show here. I mean, that'd be great. You know, the whole the whole idea of this show is to be an hour long. I, I don't know how many people know that, but the show is supposed to be an hour long. So when you look at the fact that we've had like two episodes that have even come close to being only an hour long so far, you know, we're, we're, we're this will be a great episode on meeting that bar. <laughs> it, it, it's it's actually an effort to uh, average out the total episode lengths of all of our episodes and get them closer to an hour. So we'll have a couple five-minute episodes in the future to really kind of bring that bar down to where it should be. Auditor's going to audit. Yep. Some, something like that. I'm so, just going to delete everything Pokey says. It's easy. <laughs> well, <laughs> be even so just use your imagination to fill him in. Well, on the average show, I, I only speak maybe you know five or six words. So you know how it goes. But yeah, so in terms of news for what's going on in the game, not much really. We've got the Million Clone Challenge, which has been renamed to the Five Million Clone Five Challenge. Million Clone Challenge, yeah. that's right. Um, it's going to be a, uh, I believe, a five-day event. Um, it starts on, I want to say, March fourth, so in just a, a couple of days. Um, and the goal is pretty simple: uh, terminate five million clones. Um, and uh, the rewards are a mystery BPO. Um, a set of keys 
for, it's 20 for keys, I think. lockbox is 20, 20 keys and then like uh, i think like a thousand war barge components yeah it, it's yeah. actually pretty nice i, I look at the rewards and i was like oh that's not and bad it's, it's an easy entry bar too you only you have to win like three matches i think it is i think you have to win three matches to qualify yeah, yeah. um so that's that's not hard but you obviously want to do a lot more than that if we're going to hit our five million clone requirement here uh, I forget what were the clone counts in the previous challenges. I know we obviously had I stretch and extended stretch point, goals. Two point five, I think, is kind of the record. Um, was that over the course of five days? Th- or? Three days. Okay, so it's, it's our, doable. Our, our previous million clone challenges were three day events because it was the weekend, so it'd be Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and now this is a five day event. So um, you know, it's a high bar. It's probably going to be pretty hard to get everyone to maintain that level of activity for five whole days, but. You know, it. I think it's it's certainly attainable, and I think it's worthwhile. Um, I I don't think, like for me personally, I've got like seventy some seventy plus million SP at some point, probably seventy five by now. I don't remember. Um, so like the SP rewards really really weren't worth much to me, and you know, but this this is looking really promising because I could use some more barge components because I am uh, freeloading my way through the war barge progression, and it's extremely slow. <laughs> Yeah, you unless you're way. super lucky like Kane and get War Barge drops pretty much or, every or, day. Or Jadig. Did you see <laughs> yeah, what Jadig yeah. pulled out of a box? <laughs> I didn't know they packed him that tight. He took a screenshot. It was 4,200 War Barge components in a single box. <laughs> I guess my luck meter's running a little low today. But... <laughs> oh, jeez. Yeah, I, I wish that we got uh, components on a more regular basis, even in a small amount, I, I'd feel. I mean, don't get me wrong. I think the increased drop rate and the ability to to get war barge components has improved greatly. But it would be nice to have like a to just even a drop like on a consistent basis on a win or just at the end of match, just mm-hmm. even a, a handful of them would would yeah, make I it think, a lot more were, enjoyable. I think they were talking about making that possible to do um, specifically on on wins or something like that. Yeah, because we we talked with Kane, uh, I think maybe two weeks ago, about the whole war barge component thing, and perhaps the need to move away from passive generation because it could cause issues further down the line. And the more I'm thinking about, it, the more I'm kind of in favor of that. I think that uh, kind of as he put, if trading ever comes into into play, which it should, hopefully next update, if you want to be have the the components tradable, you really can't have them passively generated because I mean. I mean, how many accounts can you have on a PS3? Like 50-something? Yeah, then they become worthless. Quite a bit, yeah. Yes, I mean, potentially, it's a pain in the ass, but potentially you could produce an obscene amount of components yeah. every day passively, and that Passive would just cause... Passive is a nightmare problem, and it, it really should shift more to active. I agree. Yeah, I mean, it works with skill points because they're not liquid. You can't move them around no matter what. But I think that in terms of uh, an asset, if you want it to be tradable, you can't have it be passively generated like that when you've got uh, accounts that are free and and basically limitless. I mean, if you've got a couple of PS3s laying around, you could really cause a a serious dent in the market, and people will do that. I mean, PC in itself is a a prime example of what passive gains can actually do, and it obviously was a disaster. So I think... Go ahead. Uh, speaking of alts, it's kind of interesting how that might play out with the the upcoming MCC event. I mean, it's a, it's a it's arguably a low barrier of entry with three wins. So like, you win your three, you go on to another character, win three, and if if the community can pull through, I mean, you could have those counts set up pretty nicely. Yeah, oh, yeah, it's a generate lot of keys and a lot of components. Um, and plus, if you're gonna if you're gonna throw lots of clones into you know with like no armor into the meat grinder to help, uh, do that on an alt where you don't trash your stats. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, at least in that regard, if you're doing it on alts, you're actually probably. I mean, you're actually it's more advantageous to do it on an alt because once you get your three wins on your main account, there's really no reason to to keep playing on that account, which is kind of a, a bad thing but you know moving on to a different account to get those components either to sell or use would probably be more advantageous to you as a player but yeah i think it'll uh, be interesting to see if people can i mean so what is that was it a million i think uh i yeah. think we just we just lost pokey i i can hear you can you still hear me yeah, yes yeah, now i can, I can hear you again okay you yeah dropped off 
Yeah, I apologize. My internet's been terrible, and the cable company's insisting it's my hardware. Yet it, we've replaced the hardware, and the problem persists. You know how. Well, it see, is. I just yeah. rent the hardware from my company, and yeah, I pay like eight bucks a month more for it. But you know what? They can't make those sorts of excuses. Well, we we purchased our hardware from the company, and like, oh well, it's out of date. So here, buy this ninety dollar modem. Oh yeah. Well, that's and then, again, yeah. that's why I rent it. It it you know yeah, it's it's eight bucks a month more. But they, it, it's their problem. If there's a problem with the hardware, they have to replace it. Yeah, well, the issue is that they've and, been out, uh, you know, twice yeah. already in like two weeks, and they've yet to do anything meaningful to fix the issue. So yeah, um, so I'm, like my wits end here. After after buying, like I, we used to have a, a place that had AT and T, and they make you buy the hardware. And after buying like three successive units from them. Uh, that's why when I became a fan of Comcast's uh, equipment rental system. Yeah, I, I have Cox Communications, and we're seriously considering moving to uh, something else just because it's they're insisting it's the hardware. How many uh, options? Hardware, do you, how, ma- how many options you got there? Like three. Um, it's like Cox, uh, CenturyLink, or Comcast. That's a lot more options than we get because we have yeah. we have AT and T and Comcast. But AT and T's like highest speed is Comcast lowest speed, so really you only have one option. And I've heard horrible things about Comcast. Uh yeah, they're 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 horrible, but they're also like the the best service you can like they're the best actual tech you can get. They're just like the worst customer service you can get. Um, and that's actually that's not even true. So like AT and T, um, your your support is outsourced to India, so you can't even understand your support people. Your com like Comcast is okay as long as you don't try and cancel, and then they send you through like the nightmare chain to cancel. Um, oh yeah, that that, you, that audio you, clip I heard is amazing from yeah, Comcast, um, <laughs> and that's not the only one. Trust me. Um, but you know their their service is all all like people who speak English as a first language, so. Yeah, that that sort of thing is which I, I've given up on phone tech support whenever I can and go straight to the chat support. I've had much better experiences uh, see, in, in all kinds of companies. See, like with, with web hosting, for example, I refuse to uh, I refuse to do any any web hosting that doesn't have an actual phone number where I can call someone who speaks English as a first language. Well, yeah, I mean, I'm I'm speaking more in terms of like uh, Amazon. I, I've tried calling Amazon; it's a pain in the ass. I go to their chat; it's so much easier and nicer. But yeah, since we've gone completely off topic, it's uh, fine. We gotta fill the time. We're filling <laughs> time, time, man. Let's talk this about is it. <laughs> service providers. But yeah, so I was asking. I mean, do you guys think we're, we're, we'll get the five million clones over the five days? I mean, it seems fairly reachable given the we'll the, the history. I think we'll do it. It's. I mean, it's a push. It's gonna. It's gonna be. It's gonna be hard. I think it's gonna be like one of those things where we're just gonna. We're gonna like barely make it. I don't think it's. I don't think we're gonna blow through it like we we did for Million Clone. Um, I think I think we're gonna have to work pretty hard to to hit it. Um, but I think it's attainable, and I think we'll get it. Yeah, and, and you were saying you know, earlier in the BPO. The, the, yeah, you, you said before the pre-show that you can't say what the BPO is, obviously, but you said it's it's definitely I, I, I worth think, people doing. Yeah, I, th- I think uh, I think people are gonna um, regret if they if they don't participate, and we you know everyone else gets the BPO. I, I think people are gonna want it, but that's all I can say. I'm sorry, Jack. I cut you off. What were you saying? Oh, yeah, man. Just like uh, we do have low numbers, but I think we had run into this last time and we had kind of went above our expectations for how we were able to push through. But even though we were kind of stymied by network connection issues, hopefully we won't have any of those problems this time around. But I, I think I think we can pull it out. We can do this. Well, especially if they really average. I mean, I'm I'm a BPO slot pretty much. I, I will do anything <laughs> for a BPO. So I mean, I'll I'll be in there throwing my my other BPO suits to the to the uh, the wolves, so to speak, because I don't care if I live or die. I just want the BPO. Got to catch them all. <laughs> pretty much. I mean, uh, there's there's a few I don't have, and they they kind of irritate me, so I pretend they don't exist usually. That's that's me and the skin weaves. <laughs> I wish I'd like, I missed that by a week. I'd signed up earlier, but I'd like, I didn't start up my beta account until I guess after that had finished. It's like, ah, I was just kicking myself on that. Yeah. That actually makes me a uh, question for Zell. I know that Rotati had been speaking in the past about that, uh, that system. He was, he was excited about the skin system. Is there any movement on that or is it still pretty, uh, 
pretty uh, uncertain. Um, I I couldn't tell you when that's gonna drop. Um, I mean, I think it's I think it's probably gonna happen. Um, it it sounded very very promising. Um, so you know, we'll see. Well, plus that's an awesome way to make money without affecting the gameplay at all. Oh, because again, yeah. I will I will spend absurd makes, amounts of money on to look pretty pretty much it makes skins much much more um viable and much more usable i think the, the big thing is you know because you know i have i have like a quaif suit is my you know throwaway suit but anytime i decide to roll something nicer it's gonna look pretty standard yeah i think that people would really appreciate that they can actually it, I mean, it, 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 customization is good pretty much now mind game. you once you can do that you will see nothing but like pink suits on the field like all the time well yeah it'll but, just be like the whole know. room will be pink everyone just give jay a headache <laughs> it, it's giving the mark of that who just doesn't care anymore because i think we're we're all at that point where it's like oh you know it's a gritty sci-fi shooter so let's put on our pink jumpsuits and run around with you know guns and whatnot <laughs> well you know that's the thing is it's sci-fi we should be able we should be a lot more colorful than these uh you know the the your call of duty your battlefield etc yeah I, I think though i disagree with some of the choices for the apex suits i think that was kind of an attempt to to make things look a little more vibrant even if some look like mexican wrestlers but regardless <laughs> That's actually another good point. I wonder how uh, the skin system will handle Apex suits if, if they'll separate their, their color skin and can they put that on other suits and whatnot. That'd be interesting to see how that plays out. I don't know. I don't think you'd do that because it's not really meant to be a cosmetic suit as much as it is meant to be a specific suit. Oh, fair enough. Yeah, I, I've been reading the forums and people are a little uh, apprehensive about this. They, they quite understand what's going on. I think people are f- afraid that uh, BPOs will turn into skins only and not actually be BPOs anymore. And I've been trying to reassure them that that's not the case. Yeah, there's, there's no way just... that CCP could turn a, a, a BPO people bought into just a skin. I, yeah. it, you know, as as we've talked about before, I think it would most certainly have to be you get the generic BPO and you get the skin. And if you want the exact same thing you had before, then you put the skin on the generic BPO and then you're good. Yeah, well, and that's good for people that have a ton of BPOs like myself, because I don't really need any more Caldari Assault BPOs. I have them in like 12 different colors. Yeah. I, if I want a different color, I'd like to buy just the color, not the suit again. So, I mean, I, I'd be more likely to spend money because I know I'm not buying something I already have. So another thing that Rattati mentioned was, uh, what was he calling them? Jump uh, myrofiber stimulants or something like that? I don't know. I, th- I I mean, I I don't know if I paid as much attention to that as others, but I thought it was just like adding additional jump height to the the uh, myofiber things um, that already exist. Yeah, he was just playing around with a dev kit when he got back from the break, and he was just doing something with the myofibs. And he was also talking about like a like a jump pack module that could go on as like an equipment. Really? I didn't see that that last part. Where where would you see that? That was in the barbershop thread. He was making um comparisons to Tribes Ascend and uh uh Warhammer 40k, I guess the jump pack system in that. So what you're saying is that we actually might be getting jetpacks and dust. Yeah. Um Oh lord. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's it's a it's a small map for a jump pack. I'm I'm gonna owe people some apologies if that actually happens because <laughs> I've, I've called many people stupid for for asking for uh, motorcycles and, and jetpacks. <laughs> so, okay, so yeah, I found the post. It says this morning, however, I spent playing on a dev kit with uh, times three jump height myrofibs, and it was awesome. So it almost sounds like it's a it's a different kind of module that is specifically for jump height. Well, I think what he had said with that is uh, he was testing it on a Minmatar Scout. And what it would allow him to do is from, I think, just a dead jump, jump onto the uh, crates, like container crates. Interesting. Yeah. if I mean, if you had three of them stacked on one character. I can see that being extremely situational if it's using slots to gain jump height. But I guess if you need to go over rough terrain quickly, you could actually justify it. But yeah, that'll be interesting. I just hope it doesn't turn into endless bunny hopping because that crap annoys the hell out of me in most <laughs> fps's 
So uh, just as a note, um, apparently at uh, GDC 2015, uh, which is which is actually this this coming week here, um, there's a there's a Valve developer who has a session scheduled for the third at 3 p.m. So you're saying Half-Life 3 is confirmed? That's that's what I'm saying. Yes. Oh, okay. Okay. So uh, yeah, just Gabe Newell just comes in there. It's, uh, how long was the session again? Um, I, I think it's like a, I think it's like an hour long session, maybe maybe a half hour. Okay, so like at the very end of the session, he, he just comes out into the stage, stands there, does nothing for the last <laughs> couple of seconds, just raises his hands in three, and then walks <laughs> off. <laughs> and every head in the theater just instantly explodes, and everyone's right. dead. Yeah, it's a session about game physics, I guess. I mean, we'll see what happens. <laughs> Tin foil is strong. Well, I mean, it's it's game physics, and elements are you know part of physics, and physics is part. And elements are part of Half Life, so clearly Half Life Three is confirmed. <laughs> yeah, I've never actually played the Half Life series. I just know the joke, and yeah, I know that's a crime that I never played them. But apparently, they're yeah, good. <laughs> yeah. Wait, 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 what? Yeah, <laughs> you, you have to understand that I got into PC gaming only a couple of years ago, do you, so like, I missed do you, most of this. Do you do you not own Half Life yet? I okay. My Steam library is probably like ninety five percent of it I've never actually installed because the Steam but, sale is but evil. Do you, but do I, you I, own... I probably own it. I probably own it. I've never installed it. Okay, you need to play at the very least. I because I actually haven't actually been through the original Half Life, but um, Half Life Two, Half Life Two Episode One, and Half Life Two Episode Two. You need to play all three of those games by next episode. So, so you're saying that they never made a Half Life three, but they made a Half Life two dash two. Yes, they they've got Half Life one and two. They've got Half Life two episodes one and two, but the one oh, thing they'll never do <laughs> is a episode. game that actually has the number three in it. Because no. bear in mind, you've also got Left for Dead one and two. You've got Portal one and two. You got Team Fortress one and two. <laughs> one and two Team Fortress. They ju- they will not make a game that ends in three. So what will actually happen is is Jadik's, uh situation. He'll come out, and hold three up, and then Half Life Two Episode Three will appear on the screen behind him, right? No, no, because that would be an Episode Three. You can't have a three. It would have to be oh. like Half Life Two Episode Two Part Two Part Two. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> the ludicrousness. It would be a better uh, troll than Legion was. Ah, uh, yeah. Ah, uh, now here you are rounding us back to the actual topics of, of, of uh, yes, well podcast. done, buddy. well done. You saw that, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So it's, I, I, yeah, Fan Fest coming up is, you know, again, it sucks that there's nothing to be specifically for Dust, but I'm glad they were forthcoming and told people before they made trips and plans and the sort to go there and be disappointed again. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's it, at least they were smart in that regard, and it's just it does suck that we aren't getting anything. But yeah, I I mean, we were we were very, you know, sure that that people needed to know that ahead of time. Um, we like there was before Frame made that post, there were people saying, oh, you know, we'll go to fa- you know at Fan Fest. I'm sure it'll be in you know beta or whatever. And I'm like, oh, no, <laughs> yeah. Well, people are still nipping at the heels of Legion. I'm just like, guys, you, you just just forget about it until you know more. It's like, I, I expect it's it's more off than you think, and it's probably not what you think. And I, you know, it, I, I don't I like really get Jason's the hopes up. assumption that it's a card game. It's going to basically be Hearthstone, but for for Eve, I'm guessing. We could totally, we could totally like like we could whip up a card game like you know during an episode. You know, someone should actually take Hearthstone and modify it to be Eve themed. I would probably actually play that. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, it's it's kind of hard to modify an actual video game because it's it's you know closed source. Um, I mean, you'd have to pick like an actual card game and and make that. I, I think it might do well in a digital format. I mean, I know that someone said in the past that there was an Eve card game that never really took off, but I think yeah, it was digital. Um, and I know like people on a who have the Eve card game. <laughs> yeah, do do you have the Eve card game? I do not actually. I would buy. I would buy it if I had it, um, if I could. But they don't sell it anymore. Um, no. If you'd like a point of shame, I have at least five thousand cards for the uh, Star Trek collectible card game. 
Oh, really? I, yeah, I was never as much I mean, of a that's, Trekkie. That's it's 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 old school, but you know. Well, awesome. I mean, your 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 Skype is OCD Trekkie, so I, I guess I expected as much. You should. I, I guess should should we segue into the the sadness that that happened this week then in regards to Star Trek? Yeah. Okay, well, for those of you who didn't know, uh, everyone Leonard, knows. Everyone knows, but you know, some people don't like dumb, you know, Snape kills Dumbledore, but um, uh, Leonard Nimoy obviously passed away this week, uh, the age of eighty-three, I believe, and he was, of course, who played Spock in the original Star Trek, and it's it's been pretty pretty crappy. I uh, it caught me by quite a surprise, and I, I never really thought of him as being old, even though I knew he was. So it was it was surprising to say the least. Yeah, I mean, I knew um, last week he was um, in the hospital, um, so you know, there was that. There was actually, um, there was apparently, um, and and this is just you know where the internet goes when it's when it's bored. Is is there was actually a um, Leonard Nimoy death hoax hoax? What? <laughs> what? So basically, you know, is you've got this whole thing where people, you know take us a random celebrity who is alive and make a death hoax and say, you know, they died and try and make a convincing news story about it. So there were people who tried to make up that the current, that his actual passing was a hoax. Uh, I, I'm not sure uh, if that's amusing or really disturbing. Yeah. Uh, the internet. That's the internet for you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah just confusing and disturbing but, uh, at the same time. No, actually, um, uh, what what really got to to me and a, a lot of people, I think, was actually his uh, Leonard Nimoy's final tweet. Yeah, I'm reading that now. Well, read it aloud. Put that. Yeah, Leonard Nimoy's final tweet: Life is like a garden; perfect moments can be had, but not preserved except in memory. Live long and prosper. Yeah, that's uh, that's pretty pretty tough stuff right there yeah <laughs> i mean you you almost wonder if people just kind of know you know it's it's coming and, and just kind of deal with it their own way but that's yeah it's, I mean, it's fitting it's, to uh, say the least you know he was in the hospital he had it was uh copd um uh he, i guess he he quit smoking 30 years ago and he said it was not soon enough yeah i mean that's it always amazes me that people even continue to smoke nowadays knowing full well the the crap it can do to you and i mean obviously it it, it basically killed him even though like you say stopped 30 years ago it can still cause irreparable damage to your body it's just it's not good stuff i haven't i mean i read this a long time ago he had like announced his wishes to like what he wanted to do with his ashes so i th- think to send them out to space to go up in the next shuttle or something like that wouldn't surprise me if that actually happened. Yeah. Well, they tried with uh, with uh, James Doohan, and they were the. the uh, I don't think the rocket actually made it to space. James Doohan, in case you uh, for for those who are not appropriate Trekkie nerds, is uh, Scotty, um, and uh, unfortunately, Scotty passed away about uh, ten years ago. So besides Shatner, who else is left in the original cast? I think they're all um, wait, no, George Takei. George Takei. George Takei. George Takei and, yeah. Uh, what's uh, what's his name? Um, uh, plays Chekhov. Uh, oh really? Yeah, Chekhov's still around. I just can't remember his name right now, and I'm gonna feel really dumb when I remember it. Um, but uh, you know he's still around. But uh, yeah. De- uh, DeForest Kelly, who is McCoy, and uh, James Doohan is Scotty. Um, uh, both passed away quite a while back, and you know Shatner's still around. Yeah, I, I know he was catching some flack because he uh, was unable to attend the funeral because I think he had a a prior engagement for a Red Cross charity like the night before, and he couldn't get a flight out there in time. People were giving him a hard time for that. Like, how do you give someone flack for for, I for being know. at a charity? He basically said that. He's like, guys, like they donated a lot of money to come see me. I can't bail on them to go to a, a funeral. You know, it's 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 the Red Cross man. I mean, you can't really blame the guy. Not to mention, I mean, I assume they were actually pretty close friends and he's probably grieving in his own way. Like cut the guy some slack, you know. Yeah. 
But yeah, it's it's obviously a, a great loss. I mean, I the original Star Trek was before my time, but you know, you still know who, who Spock is, and and you still enjoy, you know, the. He was, I mean, he he stayed very active um, too in appearances and stuff like that. Um, he's actually um, uh, one of his last appearances was uh, he he did a role in Fringe. Um, despite claiming that he was retired, he came back a couple of times to finish up the storyline. Um, and actually, one of the most surprising things to me was that after he had adamantly insisted that he was retired, he was actually the main villain of Transformers Three. <laughs> really? Yeah, it was. It was actually it was really funny because they did. Um, so I was watching Transformers Three, which you know, obviously, you go see a Michael Bay film, you do not expect anything other than there will be pretty special effects um, and there will be lots of explosions. Um, but it was kind of funny that earlier, early on in the movie, they actually had like a C, they had like a scene from the original Star Trek playing on TV. And there's like, and, and there was actually a character that's like, Oh, that's the episode where, um, uh, Spock goes crazy and tries to kill everyone. It was the statement that was made in the movie. And then he turned out to be the main villain of the that's entire awesome. <laughs> movie. It was, it was really funny. It was very well foreshadowed. Um, and, uh, you know, so that was kind of awesome. Yeah, there's also another game series that uh, I'm a big fan of, the the Kingdom Hearts series, which is the Disney Final Fantasy crossover game. But he actually uh, did the voice of the main villain in that story as well, uh, you, Master Xehanort. I know you're not a uh, not much of a PC gamer. Or, um, have you played Civilization games? Um, I have not played the actual Civilization series, but I have played games that are of that genre. Oh my gosh, you, you you're just devoid of of any real <laughs> culture. You haven't played these games. Um, uh, Leonard Nimoy did quite a bit of voice work for those as well. Um, there's there's varying uh, things in the game that are uh, quotes that from history that are, are read by Leonard Nimoy. Yeah, he's got a hell of a voice. I remember watching the uh, the trailer for Kingdom Hearts: Birth by Sleep, and his character came on, and I was like, "Holy crap, whose voice is that?" And I looked up, like, "Are you kidding me?" Like, I, I, I'd never attack because his voice got a lot better, I think, as he got older. And it was just, it just fits the character perfect. So it's a real shame. So, I mean, I'd, I'd be glad to check out other games where he's done there's working. Gonna, because there's going to be amazing. a day when there's people like, you know, coming into Biomass to do Leonard Nimoy impressions. Yeah, like maybe next week, <clears throat> Jake. <laughs> Or, or, or Jadik, if, if you've got one up your sleeve and put you in the spot like that. No, no. I think you might have to practice that a bit first. Oh, yeah. yes. Yeah. Funny enough, uh, in the same game, Mark Hamill also plays a character. Uh, it's the kind of the, the opposition to the, the letter Nimoy character. So that one's, that one's full of some interesting voices. But uh, Mark Hamill probably... does, a, does a lot of great um, voice work. Um, um, you know, he's he's the Joker in in most of the Batman oh, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. animation stuff. Yeah, you. Uh, I, he hasn't aged well, but his voice is, he's actually very talented when it comes to voice acting. So I was always surprised when I, I hear a voice and it, it sounds nothing like his other works, but he manages to actually pull it off and it, it sounds great. So, I mean, as far as like you said, the Joker, I mean, uh, I, I kind of assume, I think a lot of fans kind of feel that that's kind of the, the Joker voice. I know he's done. Oh, absolutely. He, he did it in the most recent Arkham uh, Batman games, hasn't he? Uh, I'm not sure. I, you know, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I played a little bit of one of the Arkham games, and um, I, I truly enjoyed it, but I didn't actually finish it or play any of the other ones. So um, I'll, I'll get there eventually. But... Yeah, the third one's coming out now, so I'm thinking I'm just going to wait until they release a trilogy and just do it all at once rather than buying them individually. Oh, I own them all. I just haven't played them all. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, as you seem. <laughs> But yeah, it, it's kind of cool to actually see some of these older actors that disappear and they pop up doing voice acting in, in a lot of video games. It's it's always impressed me that they've you know maintained their their uh, their career in that regard, opposed to actually acting. It's it's pretty cool to find that out because you you hear a voice, you go, "Wow, that was really good," and you look it up, and you're like, "Really, him?" Which is you know like in, like I said, in the case of Mark Hamill and uh, Leonard Nimoy, it was actually a big surprise to me to see them them popping up like that. So that's pretty cool. Have you seen the? Uh, do you remember the Priceline commercials that uh, Leonard Nimoy was in? <laughs> yes, yes, I did. <laughs> Those are fantastic. There was the other one. Uh, it was for a car commercial. I forget which car it was. Yeah, but there it was featured... one he did with uh, with Zachary Quinto, which is the newer Spock. That one was that was hilarious. I, I, I suggest anyone who hasn't seen it go on YouTube and check out the the Leonard Nimoy car commercial. It's it's hilarious. And the Priceline commercials. You just go Priceline, Priceline Leonard Nimoy. There's three of them. Um, 
because it's great. It's, uh, you know, William Shatner and his usual, usual, uh, attitude is like, you know, well, who could replace me? And, and Leonard just walks in and is like, oh, hey, hey, Bill. And he's like, hey, Leonard. And then he just looks like, oh. <laughs> like, this is awkward. <laughs> yeah, there, there's some, some pretty good ones out there. It's, again, it's, it's fun to see those old actors uh, doing, you know, more modern, newer things. Uh, it's very nostalgic for those of us who remember the, the older shows. Not to mention his role in the new Star Trek uh, movies. Like, I don't know what your opinion is, but I thought they're really enjoyable. Well, I, I like mean, them, I, yeah. I mean, I don't. I'm I'm not a big fan of the the newer movies personally, but you know, I mean, his appearance in them was great, and it was at least a tie back into it. And it wasn't they they did go you know out of their way to not just like completely ignore the existence of you know the past 40 years of fantastic television and movies that that i come from you know um but uh i i I, my biggest thing is that i i expect star trek to have um more than just action and it that they really had had moved it into an you know the action movie category yeah that, that that's fair but uh, at the very least, it was interesting. At least for me, I liked it because they kind of kept the old retro style of kind of the bright, flashy colors, but really modernized it and made it uh, feel like a modern movie. So I think in that regard, it was it was really cool. But you, you do raise a good point that they kind of moved to a more action theme uh, for the movie rather than... Uh, well, I mean, Star Trek has been covering a ton of issues for a very long time across multiple uh, series. I think that was the... F- I think uh, the first interracial relationship on television, wasn't it? With Spock and uh, Hora? Um, yeah, that, that I mean, that was... Uh, Star Trek has a kind of a long history for doing that sort of thing. Um, I mean, it's always like... They always have like a, kind of a, a weasel phrase of how they're getting away with it, you know? Um, it, it was... That was the first time um on television that had been shown but it was like well it was forced by an alien um and then there was a deep space nine episode was actually the first lesbian kiss ever on tv um and that was because one of the characters had previously been a guy and so they'd been in a previous relationship type of thing um so you know but uh that's actually that those are very contentious things for them to actually put on tv and you know would be you know, some of those things like when you first saw like a show like CSI come out where, where it's like, oh my gosh, look at all the gore that they're putting on network television. Um, it, it was kind of that sort of crazy out there thing for Star Trek to do those things at the time. Yeah, I think I remember uh, listening to an interview with the actress that played her and she was talking about a time where she had been speaking with uh, Martin Luther King and she had mentioned offhand that she was considering quitting the show and he's like – no, you need to, you should really keep doing what you're doing because it's, it's actually a really positive thing. And she basically said, oh, okay, yes, sir. And so, I mean, obviously it was recognized as a, as a, a very important uh, uh, symbol, I suppose, for, for that whole movement. So I think that's, that's really cool that, you know, the series as a whole has is, is really kind of been trying to push the limit in that regard and, and try to push some of those social issues and, and uh, get them out there because well, I mean, that's a lot what of science fiction is at its core is, um, you know, finding ways to discuss current day issues in, in ways that, uh, you know, you couldn't necessarily do in, in a a direct context. Yeah. I think it makes it easier for people to accept because they're, they're looking at it as the fantasy setting and, oh, well, of course, you know, because whatever the the lame reason is like, you know, previously a guy, uh, so the lesbian kiss is okay. But I think that if you give people kind of that work around, they can get their head around a little bit easier and it makes it easier for them to actually think about it rather than having it be in your face. Like, you know, a lot of discussions are. So that's, it's good that I think that, that science fiction in general has kind of been a platform for that to, to push that issue or various issues rather. Um, for for people to to talk about at the very least i think it's it's a good example of social progress through media you know well that's i mean that's that's the thing with social progress is it's it's about people's um you know built-in experience and feelings and it's not something that you can totally handle on a on a just factual scientific basis sometimes you kind of have to put it out there in, in the public eye yeah, I mean, regardless of how you feel or what your personal beliefs are, I think it's good 
if a platform exists where people can actually openly discuss something like that, you know, and, and come to a conclusion rather than just not talking about a period, which I think is a lot of what holds back, you know, social changes and whatnot. So I think that that's, it, it's really, it's good stuff, no matter how you look at it or, or how the, the end result um, ends up becoming. Yeah. So, um, so, Hey, um, I, I hear there's this game that, I, that I've played for a while. It's called dust five, one, four. Dude, I'm trying to fill an hour here. Okay. <laughs> struck me that we haven't talked about our topic or, you know for like at least a half an like hour now 20 minutes yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> but yeah no uh it's a fun game I mean, what have you guys been uh, been playing lately i mean anything different that you've been doing new in game anything you're trying out i i respect uh, a little while ago just to uh mainly three suits and a vehicle but uh, primarily, I've been running uh, Minmatar Scout with knives and a plasma cannon. No cloak, but it's just, it's been a lot of fun. People keep telling me Minmatar is the way to go. I haven't actually made the leap yet. I still it's, have all, all yeah, it's a rush. Stuff. And then I back it up with a, um, a, I think a Keldari Heavy or a Sentinel there with um, Ishikone Forge gun, an assault forge. <laughs> so I've, I've, I've hopped on that bandwagon. It's a it's a pretty legit setup actually, but yeah, the Mimitar suits lately are just holy crap. They this one guy I was on uh, I figure what the map is called, but it's the one with the big tower in the middle, and I was trying to catch up with him, and he's zipping around this box so fast I couldn't find him, and he just disappeared because he was moving so Ashland fast. Is the one with the big tower in the middle, though, by the way. Okay, okay, but yeah, the the Mimitar suits are just absurdly fast when they really fit them for speed. It's it's insane how how quick they can move around. I mean, it's not even strafing; just the fact that he can get behind cover and dart up and down places is it's nuts. So I mean, that's that's kind of cool to see, but also frustrating from someone who <laughs> likes to run commandos, which are yeah. lumbering behemoths. So... <laughs> yeah, they they need a little a little pick me up, uh, but that's a that's a whole other thing. And the suits themselves are are decent. They just need a, a small buff, I think, in a lot of a lot of categories. I know. I was, just, jump pack could help you out there. I was trying to use um, my Kaldari commando suit because that's what I have um, against tanks, and it was not working very well. Well, yeah, if you want to fight tanks, you got to go Galente or Mimitar pretty much to get the, the damage buff on the weapon. Yeah. Give it actually, I'll get there. Yeah, Mimitar ones are they're interesting. They they play a lot differently than the Galente ones. Galente was my first commando, and I, I maxed that out, and I'm a self-proclaimed uh, plasma cannon lover, so I, I use that a lot. But I, I recently got into the Mimitar to, to see the... Uh, the swarm launcher side of things, but honestly, I've been having a lot more fun running a combat rifle in Mass Driver with the Mimitar Commando. Oh, which is... combat rifles! I hate combat <laughs> rifles. I actually use the Militia yeah. Assault one because I like the Assault version, but I don't want to use Advanced because I'm that cheap. But yeah, it's it's a lot of fun unless it's a, a uh, Sentinel, in which case I'm basically screwed because I can't kill him in one magazine. And well, Mass Driver against Sentinel is basically a waste of time. But yeah, it's, it's been fun having scouts come running at me and, you know, one shot and they go flying into the air with the, the mass driver. <laughs> yeah. It, it's, I, I used them in the past and I just haven't really picked them up until, again, really recently. And I forgot how much fun they are. I mean, they're a little situational, but with the commando, you can swap back to your combat rifle and it's a little more flexible then. So I, I do suggest that if people are looking for something a little different to try out, the the other vehicle pilots will, will hate me because you know the, they're always bitching about the uh, the, the mid mando with the swarms. But the the fact of the matter remains that actually even for just anti infantry, the combat rifle and master our combo is extremely fun. You're you're viable in a lot of different situations, and it it really kind of defines that flexibility that the commando has. So I, I do suggest that if you're looking for something to to train into and a little different to try out. Yeah, I'm kind of missing that. That's that's what I spec'd out of and just wanted a change of a little pace, but uh, I, I do miss it. Yeah, one thing I might try, and I, I always suck at it in every game I play, but is actually trying to snipe. Um, it's like the only thing I... Sniping and dropships is like the only thing I don't do in the game, and I think dropships are a lost cause on me, so I might just try maybe a, a Kaldari uh, commando with a sniper rifle and, and see how that goes. Yeah, I've got a dedicated mouse now for sniping. So I just use my controller for everything else, and then when I hop into a sniping fit, I just jiggle the mouse. 
Yeah, I, I need to, to try the mouse and keyboard. My Unfortunately, my, my living room setup is not really conducive to using a mouse and keyboard, but I, I've heard a lot of good things about it for piloting vehicles, particularly tanks, because they lack uh, some of the controls that you can you can do on a controller. Like, for example, you can't turn and go full speed at the same time with the controller because for which the control stick to the side means you're turning, you also slow down. Uh, but the mouse and keyboard doesn't have that issue, so I, mean, I need to give that a shot. True, but I mean, module switching is a pain with mouse and keyboard. Yeah, I, I typically, like, I, I'll play PC FPSs and I'll actually hook my controller up and use it on, on the PC game because I just, I don't typically like uh, mouse and keyboard controls. Like for aiming, it's great, but moving around, it's just, it's a pain in the ass. So, I mean, I, I totally get why sniping would make sense with the mouse because you're typically not going to be moving around that much. Yeah, I've been. I mean, regards to sniping, I've been seeing abundance of thales and a couple rodents. I mean, they're 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 popping up more and more. What's the uh, special effect on uh, a special effect on the the rodent sniper rifle? It's a uh, one shot, so it's kind of like a bolt action, but it uh, has I think five hundred and fifty damage per shot. Wow. Yeah, so um, it's it's gonna mess up your day. <laughs> now, is that the new officer one, or is that one of the ones that accidentally got slipped in? Um, I'm not, I think it might be like a specialist. Like it's something interesting. That your your MCC can produce. Okay. Or, uh, yeah, yeah, that's, your, that's your interesting. Yeah, I, I again, I typically suck at sniping in almost all games except maybe Borderlands, which isn't really the kind of sniping you'd see in in most uh, FPSs like Dust and whatnot. So we'll see how it goes. It'll probably be disastrous. I've never had good luck with it. <laughs> I haven't seen a. Uh... Are you familiar with uh, Nod? Uh, I think Nod Karas is his name. Uh, he, uh, no, I'm not. Uh, he's a player who's, I guess, um, usually does these things on YouTube called like his hunting records. But there's like little montages of him going around. And I think a lot of his earlier work was uh, him uh, just headshotting people without it, like going into scope. And he's, I think he still does that occasionally. But like his <laughs> his ability to just go around in like a, a close quarters 1v1 environment with a sniper rifle was just ludicrous because i mean you're pretty much it's it's all luck at that point i mean doesn't it the the cone is just like absolutely huge from the hip he's not even quick scoping in no oh he, a little bit sometimes he does um there's tricks you can do to like kind of like readjust the sight each time so that it, it has like a, a smaller cone when you can fire from the hip Interesting. Yeah, I, I, I've seen montages in other games of people quick scoping with a sniper rifle, and it's just, I, I don't know how they do it. It's insane. So what about you, Zell? What have you been playing with in Dust besides your, your Kaldari Commando? I, I, I really, I just enjoy killing tanks. They make It makes me feel happy. I, I play cathartic. swarm launchers. <laughs> when I get out there, I'm almost indefinitely in, in swarm launchers or, you know, I, something plus a swarm launcher. So I'll ask you, because uh, I know you, you hate vehicles of the passion, and obviously use swarms quite a bit. Uh, do you think the swarm launchers are too easy to use? I do not. They're actually a pain in the butt. Um, they don't, like, the problem is that they're slow. Um, you know, the, the issue is that, you know, half my shots are going to hit a wall. Because by the time they get over there, you're already, you're, you're moving out of the way. And, you know, if I'm trying to shoot around a socket, which usually I am... Um, there's there's very little chance of me actually hitting a target. Meanwhile, uh, and, and the other thing, too, is that I have to lock invisibility of a tank. It's very, very hard to kill a tank with that actually is trying to kill you back. Because you have to be visible. You have to have a line of sight to lock a swarm launcher. And unlike a forge gun, where you can actually you can charge up in cover and then just peek out and launch it. It's, it's the and reason it's I ask is because people um, obviously complain about the swarms, but don't complain about the plasma cannon. Uh, and I, I mean, statistically, they aren't too different. I mean, swarms are obviously better in terms of DPS, but regardless, like, I'm, I'm wondering if the main issue is that the swarms are too easy to use, or perhaps they're easy to use in the wrong I, aspects I, compared I to the, the plasma cannon. I think the whole, I think it's a, a misconception based on the whole notion that it tracks and saying, well, it, you know, it auto aims, so it must be awesome because the issue is that it's really slow and it's, you know, there's actually like, if you want, if you want to accurately hit people with it, 
you have to actually like you have to kind of lead it because it's got like it fires out of the front of the swarm launcher and then arcs a bit so like a lot of times you can you you end up like firing facing away like you'll lock it and then fire away or up to try and kind of nudge the arc the way you want it to go to get you know around an obstacle you think that they're you know that they're part way behind or that they're about to be behind so you try you got to try and nudge it around things a bit it's it's actually a pain in the butt um and it's slow and usually likely to fail yeah i I actually will tend to shoot a a lock and then i'll aim up about 45 degrees and then fire them upwards to kind of get them to go uh, because they'll tend to arc into the ground if you fire straight at the vehicle so i tend to give it some elevation that they arc down into the vehicle um, just out of curiosity, if the missiles move faster but had a, uh, a a slower turning rate, how would you feel about that? I'd be more than okay with that. It 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 really is. I think it's the speed is the most crippling thing about swarm launchers is that you're firing it on the expectation of where that vehicle is going to be in you know five seconds or ten seconds. Yeah, that's just something that someone had mentioned on the forums, and it, it kind of piqued my interest. The idea that they don't turn very quickly, so you pretty much have to fire straight at them, but they get there faster to compensate for that that uh, decreased turn or rather increased turning radius. And so you, you'll see less of rockets going around corners, but you can hit things if they're moving, yeah. you know, and I m- think away or... I also think some of the issues with people complaining about things, you know, going around corners or stuff may not always be that they're going around corners as well as people think. And more that there's latency in them actually being recognized is there, um, because I've seen people saying, "Oh, well, this, you know, those swarms went like through a building." It's actually more likely that they didn't go through the building than that your client incorrectly rendered them coming through a building. Well, yeah, latency is always an issue. I mean, I guess for me, my my whole thing is that I, I like them to be viable, but make them feel as if they're fair. I mean. It's like I, I quote the plasma mechanics. I mean, I use it a lot, so I, I know exactly how difficult it is to use. And people don't really complain about it, even though it actually can wreck shield tanks up close if you get them in the right situation. And so I'd like to see the swarms get to a point where people feel that being killed by them is fair because the use of a swarm is difficult enough that it's it's actually you know worth it. But I also don't want to make it impossible to use if, if you get what I'm saying. Yeah, I'm, it's, it's, you know, I, I haven't found it in any point in which people don't hate swarms one way or the other. Um, it seems like they're either completely ineffective and, ve- and and they're believed by vehicle users to be balanced, or they can actually k- kill things on occasion and are viewed to be horribly OP. Well, I think it's a lot of it has to do with the fire and forget mechanic that you can, once you have the lock on, they're going to track that vehicle would, no matter what. The thing is, is... The fire and forget mechanic is a nerf. It's a downside. If I could control that sucker all the way to the target, I would never miss. Well, that might actually be something worth looking at then, is maybe uh, there isn't a lock time per se, but you fire it and you actually have to maintain, you know, uh, I'll call it a lock, but you have to maintain your line of sight on the target. The missiles will go to where you're pointing it. Obviously, barring any use against infantry, you don't want to get too out of hand. But my point being that you actually have to aim the damn thing to make it go where you want it to go, rather than I locked on, now I can run away because my missiles are going to kill them, and I can just, you know, walk away You'd from probably it. probably die a lot faster, actually. <laughs> but, I, well, I mean... Again, I, I don't I don't want it to be unviable, but I think it would be good to add like, more skill so, to the use of the weapon, you know? I was doing... Um, I, you know, I, I was swarming against a couple of blaster tanks, and one of them was Duna. Um, you know, Duna. If you're oh, if yeah. you're fighting tanks, you're going to run into Duna. Um, but the thing was, was his blaster tank could still kill me before I could lock a second uh, volley. Yeah. And well, I have to be in line of sight to fire that weapon. Be, unlike a forge, where I can hide and charge it and then just duck out and launch it. So, I don't understand how anyone can say that swarms are you know, horribly OP when it takes like, you know, a bare minimum of like three shots to kill something. And that thing can kill me before I can get off two shots. Yeah. Like I said, I think that adding a a level of skill required to actually use the weapon. I would like like a level of skill added to tanks. (laughs) 
Well, because when I they will can admit that when they can to... sit there and not be hurt by three fourths of the weapons in the game, and can just point and shoot at everything else and have it die, I I don't see where swarms need an additional layer of skill. I I think tanks need an additional layer of skill. Well, I'm I'm with you on that. I think that the move to and they're trying to move away from this, but it, it's not going as far as I would like. But I mean, back in the day, it took actually quite a bit of of skill or at least the knowledge of how to properly regulate modules because you basically unlike a typical armor tank you'd have three hardeners a repair which was active not passive and then a plate so you were and sometimes even a, a damage control in your high slot so you were basically cycling four or five modules at once and you had to pay attention to them and, and make sure they were working you know properly and it was it was very a lot of micromanaging but it made tanking difficult in the regard that you couldn't just jump into a tank you know, roll your face on your controller and have kills pop out. And I think they, they really overly simplified it and made it so basically anyone can tank without really thinking because half the shit is passive. And I, I, I want to move back towards more micromanagement of the modules because I think you then have not only more flexibility, but you can't just hop into a vehicle and have it work for you. You know, when I take damage, turn the hardener on and profit is kind of what it's at right now. And I don't think anyone really is enjoying that you know, the tankers or the, the AV guys. You know, we're actually over an hour. We can we can close this thing out now. Yeah, yeah. I, I figured I could talk to you about vehicles and get you talking for at least 15, 20 minutes on it. So we, we, we've probably accounted for all these sounds to cut out. So we'll, we'll actually move into shout outs. Yeah, I think, I think. we'll be good. Uh, so yeah, we'll start at the top with Jadik. Um, all right. Um, I'd like to give my shout out to a Japanese Dust user on Twitter. Um, at Bray, B-R-A-Y underscore 42. Uh, they had made this uh, animation. It's like a, like a quick 14-second uh, clip of an Amarian uh, assault soldier walking into a Kaldari mercenary quarters and cracking open a beer and sitting down on the couch and watching some TV. It was nice. That is yeah. a nice dream that maybe something we'll actually be <laughs> right. able to do. Yeah. Uh, it was good. It was really good. All right, and uh, Soraya. There's only there's only one shout out I can give this this week, and uh, that is that is my shout out to Leonard Nimoy for making uh, the the uh, greatest science fiction franchise ever. Uh, really, what it is. Yeah, it's it's a pretty mournful loss. I, you, like I said, I, I wasn't even a huge Trekkie, and I was pretty bent out of shape about it. So um, me as well, uh, my shout out goes to Leonard Nimoy and his friends and family. It was a, it was a terrible loss. He was cool. He was, he was nerdy before it was cool to be nerdy. You know, uh, Star Trek has obviously been a, a big part of our culture and, and he was a big part of Star Trek. So it, it's terrible to see him go. Um, but yeah, it's, as, as the great Spock once said, loss of life is to be mourned, but only if the life was wasted. And I, I think his life by no means was wasted. I think that he, he did a lot of great things for for the franchise and, and for the culture in general. So, uh, you know, it's it's sad to see him go. But uh, as he said, you know, live long and prosper. And I, I think he definitely did that. So mm -hmm. with that, yep. uh, yeah, I think we'll, we'll call episode 43 to a close here. And uh, thanks for, for bearing with our our. our attempts to waste time and, and make the show actually be an hour long. So uh, with that, uh, this is the biomass crew.